Thing. Wilder Fury, are you still working with Deontay? I've answered that question a gazillion times before. I know. I, everyone knows I'm not working with Deontay, and I haven't been shy about it. Uh, my relationship professionally as a, a promoter for Deontay and working with his team ended when I set up the DAZN meeting, which is also perverse. What did I do? I tried to talk to everyone in the marketplace and make a best effort to make the most money for a guy that I cared about and I worked with. Isn't that what I'm supposed to do? And, but you know what? I mean, he, I had a decent run with Deontay. I have nothing bad to say about him. I wish him and his family well. If I see him, I'll, I'll say hi. I don't think he has a bad word to say about me. And, and we'll keep it that way. It was never a secret that Lou DiBella was exiled and subsequently excommunicated from PBC Island for having been the one to initiate the meeting between Deontay Wilder, all his people, Finkel, Heyman, and John Skipper of DAZN in order to iron out a deal that would have seen Deontay fighting Anthony Joshua at least two times with a prelude of a Brazil fight. Brazil, who we all know was his mandatory challenger. It was never really a secret that by initiating this meeting, it would subsequently result in Lou DiBella and PBC severing ties. Rather, rather, the PBC severing ties with him because since that time, he hasn't worked with them. You don't see Lou at the PBC shows, the PBC press conferences these days, especially not in the abundance where you used to before. He was very much a part of that conversation in the past, though not involved here today. And that meeting that he initiated is the why, is the reason. But what did Lou do it was so wrong. that he fell out of the PBC's good graces? I mean, why is he not in the picture anymore? Why would setting up that meeting leave him so exiled and excommunicated from PBC Island? I'll tell you why. There's a few reasons. You know, he brought Wilder to the negotiation table with John Skipper, with DeJone. And that in and of itself Just that. might not have rubbed the people over there at the PBC the, the right way because... They didn't want a meeting. Maybe they didn't want to negotiate. Maybe it wasn't their intention to see the fight get done. I mean, many people out there, myself included, believe that, you know, they don't really want that fight so much as they're using the synergy around that fight, around the Joshua fight, to keep Wilder's name relevant. That they don't actually want to fight for the undisputed championship because they've rejected several offers many times in the past. I mean, what was this one? The fifth? This sounds familiar. Wilder's team perhaps didn't want a meeting with John Skipper, didn't want to iron out the details for an Anthony Joshua fight because, lest we forget, even when Deontay Wilder sent that email offer, with no contract, by the way. Remember that? Even when Wilder sent that email. Months before. Alleging that he's got $50 million for Anthony Joshua to fight. Even when he sent that email, Wilder, his team, they didn't want to meet. Nope. They didn't want a meeting. Shelly Finkel. Nope. He declined requests from Eddie Hearn to meet up with them. And that was back when Wilder sent that email. And, you know, if you got any kind of common sense, you're talking about these vast sums of money. How are you supposed to iron out the particulars, mull over the contracts, get the deal done without sitting down? with the other party. Yet it was Shelley Finkel that didn't think it would be productive to meet. And that was back in April of 2018. Wilder's team was in no hurry to meet in April of 2018 to iron out the terms of an offer that they made. You fast forward to almost a year later in March of 2019 when they're offered a hundred million dollars from DAZN. An article from Boxing Anthem reads, Skipper reminded Wilder at the meeting that he was offering the Alabama slugger unprecedented money, according to an individual who attended the session, to which Wilder's powerful manager and premier boxing champions head Al Heyman whispered in Wilder's ear and referred to the massive sum as quote-unquote training camp money to Heyman's retired fighter, Floyd Mayweather Jr. They handled it unprofessionally, to be honest. They went to that meeting just because they needed to know how much to supplement Wilder from what Showtime was offering, said the individual, who spoke on the condition of anonymity because they were not authorized to speak publicly on the matter. Showtime's Espinoza, meanwhile, 
told the Times after Wilder's news conference that the network which brought Joshua to U.S. television intends to have continuing discussions with Wilder to stage the Joshua fight. And we see where those discussions have gone. I mean, Showtime's not even in the picture anymore. Not really. Wilder's fighting on Fox. I mean, that's where his last fight was. So what about those continued discussions? Oh, well... Those discussions are, uh, they went to the same place that Wilder's commitment to Showtime and Showtime's commitment to Wilder, they went where those things went. And that is nowhere. You see, as a result of that, seeing what was on the table for Deontay Wilder to not only fight Anthony Joshua, but, but a reasonable compensation package to have a fight with Dominic Brazil on DAZN, as a prelude, because they knew he was going to fight Brazil next. They knew that was a fight that that, that, that was going to happen anyway. So they, they, they offered him $20 million to have that fight on the zone. That would have been the prelude to the Joshua fight, the Joshua fight. Two of them. They offered Wilder $20 million to have that fight on their side of things. And what might have rubbed them the wrong way is that as a result of that, now, we've got to give Wilder $20 million. We've got to give him $20 million because that's what these guys just offered him. This is the $20 million that Dan Raphael was talking about ahead of what was the Luis Ortiz rematch. He specified that, yeah, Wilder was given $20 million. Which is going to be a loss. To reject DeZone's offer, which we all know he did. He never crossed over to DeZone. Wilder was given some kind of compensation package to reject his own's offer, and this came out of somebody's budget. This came out of somebody's pocket, whether it was Showtime's or, or Al Heyman's own pocket. But it costed somebody a, a lot of money. But they ain't get back yet. And this was as a result of this meeting that Lou DeBella initiated. This meeting that Lou DeBella set up. Had Lou DeBella never set up this meeting, Wilder would have never sat down with John Skipper and got offered this money. In person. It's a big difference between offering somebody something via social media, letting them know that this is on the table, and actually sitting down with them face to face. You know, had they offered him, the, you know, had they made that same offer publicly, what Wilder and his team likely would have done was blown it off as bluster. You know, oh, you're just saying that in front of a lot of people. We don't believe you and we're not going to meet with you. But the fact that there was actually a meeting set up, an actual sit-down conference between the people at the zone and all of Wilder's people, well, now you know that they mean business and worse. Now the boxing community knows that they mean business. And what do you guys do? You blow off the offer. Aww. You blow off the offer because you don't actually want that fight. You didn't even want to be here to begin with. You're only here because Lou DeBella set this thing up. Aww. So now to keep up appearances, you'll go to the meeting, but you ain't down to accept anything that they're offering you. Why? Because you don't actually want this fight. At least not now. You can imagine... Wilder's people were none too pleased at this, some of them, because this would mean that they were going to have to overpay Deontay Wilder a sum of money that they weren't about to get back. They have to pay him this to compensate him for what he's rejecting from DAZN. And all of this is as a result of this meeting that Lou DeBella set up. In essence, all of this is Lou DeBella's fault. Uh, my relationship professionally as a, a promoter for Deontay and working with his team ended when I set up the DAZN meeting which is also perverse. What did I do? I tried to talk to everyone in the marketplace and make a best effort to make the most money for a guy that I cared about and I worked with. Well, Lou, maybe that's not what Al Heyman wants. Maybe that's not where his concern, his focus lies. Maybe he's more focused on maintaining the relationships with the networks that he's affiliated with. Maybe he's more concerned making promises to them as opposed to ensuring that his fighter gets the most money that he can get. The kind of money that Showtime wasn't giving him, not up until that point, and the kind of money that Fox still isn't giving him. I mean, you guys do realize that whatever Wilder was given to reject DeZone's offer, it was as a direct result of what DeZone offered him. Not Wilder's earning power, not his marquee value, not what he generates so much as what DeZone offered him to have that fight as a prelude to the two Joshua fights. That's the only reason Wilder was given a compensation package, because they had that to compensate him for. They didn't want to let him go to DAZN, so they got to give him something so that he doesn't. And they might not have wanted to give him something. They might not have planned on giving him something to the tune of 15 or 18 or whatever it is they gave him. They might not have had that in their plans, but they had to incorporate it into their plans because Lou went ahead and set up this meeting. This meeting that they really didn't even want to have. Oh.
And this effectively answers Lou DiBella's question. You know, what did he do wrong? What was so wrong about setting up that meeting with the zone? It's almost perverse that he's being punished, in some ways punished, penalized, at minimum excommunicated from PBC Island for setting this meeting up. Yet the only reason he did it was because he wanted to get the ball rolling for the Wilder versus Joshua fight. And in effect, get Wilder the most money that he can get him. Because to Lou, that's his job. Whereas when it comes to Al Heyman, the supposed advisor to the stars, I mean, this guy's being called an advisor, but he sounds a lot like a promoter. That's what he really is. Uh, to him, it's not that important to get Wilder the most money that he can, so much as to ensure to the networks that he's partnered with that they get his content from his fighters. One of his fighters being Deontay Wilder. Al Heyman has to assure Showtime and or Fox. Now Fox, because we all know Showtime, has taken a back seat to them. Bigger network, bigger budget, more exposure for his fighters. It's not hard to put two and two together. It's not. Point being, Al Heyman's real interests lie with maintaining those relationships. This is no mere advisor. Obviously not. As no mere advisor has this kind of agamonical control over his clients. If anything, it's the other way around. In a normal... Advisory. You know, client-advisor relationship, the advisor don't got power over the client. The client has power over the advisor. That's not happening here. What's happening here is Al Heyman and his stable of slaves Slaves! are subject to whatever decisions he deems fit, he deems necessary, and he did not deem it necessary for Deontay Wilder to accept that $100 million offer from the zone. He didn't think it was necessary. What's more important, what's more necessary is for Al Heyman to make sure that these partnered networks get his content. Because lest we forget, his budget is coming from them. Now, this might seem like ancient history because a lot has happened since then, since, you know, March of last year. We know that Anthony Joshua lost his belts and subsequently won them back. And in, in, in the process of doing that, scored a payday worth more than Wilder stood to make for fighting him, fighting him two times. Anthony Joshua raked in an $85 million payday as a result of that one Andy Ruiz rematch. Whereas Deontay Wilder would have made $80 million, $5 million less than Anthony Joshua just did for fighting Anthony Joshua two times. In, in, in effect, Anthony Joshua's marquee value, his market value, has increased from the time that he was trying to iron out a deal with Wilder. And I feel that that makes a Wilder fight that much more difficult to make because Wilder and his people, they want him to be on equal footing with Anthony Joshua, but the numbers are what they are, and what the numbers show is that he is in no way, shape, or form on equal footing with Anthony Joshua, and so long as they stick to those demands of theirs, the fight might not happen. If it's Tyson Fury, a guy who's got the gift of gab, a guy who contradicts himself a whole lot, you know? If it's Tyson Fury that wins in February, I could see the undisputed heavyweight championship title fight happening because even if Tyson Fury is a little spacey, a little crazy, even if he is, God bless him, but even if he is those things, you know who's not those things? Bob Arum. You know who else is not those things? Frank Warren. These guys are realists. They know what Tyson Fury's actually worth, and they know what they stand to make if they let him fight Anthony Joshua. Money for everybody. More money for Fury and everybody else than Fury can bring in fighting anyone else. So if Fury is the victor in February, I can very much see the undisputed heavyweight title fight happening sometime this year, maybe late. But if it's Wilder, there's no telling when this guy's gonna come down off of that cloud. That is, there's no telling when his people will allow him to come down off of that cloud because we all know this guy does what he's told this guy's got no control over what's going on he is merely a puppet to be puppeteered by the master puppeteer al hyman (laughs) he is a whereas when it comes to tyson fury's side of things they are a little bit more realistic at least more realistic than wilder's people and i know i know that right now there are quotes floating around from old Bob Arum saying he thinks that this Wilder Fury rematch is going to do two million pay-per-view pots. I know that that's not very realistic. But at some point, you've got to use your own common sense. At some point, you yourself as an individual have to be able to distinguish 
tongue-in-cheek comments from the actual kind of individual that you're dealing with. Bob Arum hasn't been in this business as long as he has being a wide-eyed optimist or anybody's patsy. He knows that Tyson Fury's best bet at reeling in a massive payday with enough money for, you know, to go around for everybody. He knows, just like Frank Warren knows, that Tyson Fury's best bet at doing that is an Anthony Joshua fight. Anything else will, will be small potatoes. If he beats Deontay Wilder in February in the rematch, that is the logical next step rather than gambling with contenders who may upset you before you get the chance to fight Anthony Joshua and reel in that payday. They know that. They're not going to gamble. They don't want to leave it to chance. If Tyson Fury wins that rematch, the next thing for him to do, the next logical thing for him to do, is to fight Anthony Joshua immediately thereafter. They know. And if he wants to stick around and defend those belts, it's his prerogative. He could pull in a couple more paydays doing that, though I don't expect him to. Aww. That is, I wouldn't. Better still, you know, Frank, Bob, these old guys, they're realists. They don't got time for the bluster. They don't got time for the hubbub. They might tell the people in the media things like they're expecting, you know, this fight to bring in two million pay-per-view buys. But you'd have to be naive yourself to believe that they believe that. They have all the receipts that me and you don't have. They know the numbers. They have immediate access to them. And they'll talk up a fight as much as they've got to talk up a fight. But they know what's going on here. They, they know Tyson Fury you know, his ticket sales here stateside, and they know that he's not the draw in the United Kingdom the way that Anthony Joshua is a draw in the United Kingdom. They know all these things more intimately than I or you. So believe me when I tell you that if Tyson Fury wins the Wilder rematch, they'll take the fight with Joshua before Wilder. Whereas Wilder and his people, they seem quite content conducting interviews to explain why things aren't happening as opposed to doing what they've got to do on their end to make things happen, that you are not the equivalent, you are not equivocal to Anthony Joshua anywhere on the face of the earth, in the realm of marquee value, which is what this is all about. You know, Wilder's fans have taken a liking to accusing other people of being fanagers, fans that act as managers, when all we're doing is highlighting what Deontay Wilder is talking about. Money is a motivating factor and issue for Wilder. He made that clear to Jim Gray post-fight after the Brazil knockout. The biggest fight will happen, I promise you that. We'll come patient, come time, and I just want you guys to have patience and, have, and give us a little time to make this thing happen. The way we all benefit from it, not only just you fans, because we risk our lives in here. So we want to be, we want to make sure we have, we get the best and the most money that's possible for we risking our lives. I mean, the head is not meant to be hit in the first place. So just let us let us get our time to do recognize by what you're saying. And with all due respect to these other opponents, the public does not want to see Ruiz. The public does not want to see Dominique Brazil. The public does not want to see whoever this guy is that's fighting Tyson Fury. They want to see you three fight like Ali fought Frazier, like Ali fought Foreman, like Foreman fought Frazier. So to be recognized in that type of breath for the modern day, you've got to get it on. They don't want to have a whole lot more patience. Most definitely, you know. But, it, <laughs> but you know what the saying is, Jim? <laughs> good, good thing come to those who wait. <laughs> Wilder's the one who told you guys to be patient. Wilder's the one that told you motherfuckers to wait. So sit there and wait.